Um, We are reading Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. If you've got a church Bible, that's on page 1132, but it's also on the screen. Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now imagine if you went into a a business meeting with a PR company uh, and uh, their logo designers were there with you and you're about to launch your global movement. Uh, You need to design your logo with them. Uh, And you say to them, for my logo, I would like to have a hangman's noose or maybe an electric chair or some sort of symbol of execution and death. That's what I want as my logo for my global movement. That would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? But that's what the cross uh, is for Christians. Universally, it is recognized as the symbol of all Christians across the globe. Uh, Why not a crown? Why not a lamb? Why not a heart or a vine? Because all of these images are uh, associated with Jesus. All of them could, you could argue, equally be used as the, the, the symbol for the Christian faith. Well, we are what you might call an evangelical church, uh, uh, and by the way, that has nothing to do with American politics on our end, Uh, so uh, if you've heard that on the news, that's not us. Uh, It's not necessarily about a particular style of worship either. Uh, uh, This is our fourth week of of looking in, in our own church at what it means to be an evangelical church. So for those of you that are guests... Uh, you, you wouldn't have realized that, but this is, this is part of what we've been doing for four weeks. If you've missed any of these and you'd like to catch up, you can watch them all on YouTube. But one historian clarified that being an evangelical involves four key things. It's about having a changed heart that makes a person a Christian in the first place. It's about having a life that is actively lived for Jesus, particularly in sharing that news about Jesus with others. It's about a real commitment to the Bible as God's way of speaking to us. And it's also believing that Jesus died on the cross for us and for our sin on our behalf. And those four things are what it means to be an evangelical. So that symbol that we have at the Christian faith of a cross, a symbol of execution, that is right at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. And what's more, the cross actually has a connection with baptism, uh, as we're going to carry out in a few minutes. The early Christian Paul, who wrote the words that we read out earlier, um, he also wrote that when we're baptized, we're identifying with Jesus' death. So when we're plunged into the water, it's like the old life is gone, is dead, just as Jesus laid down his life, so our life Uh, the old life has gone. And then coming up out of the water uh, pictures that a new life has begun just as Jesus came back to life again on the third day after his death. So baptism is a physical way of saying that Jesus' death was for me and my life now belongs to him. So that's what Jesse and Rhea will be doing in just a moment. Now, the death of Jesus, the cross of Jesus, is about lots of different things. I found a quote uh, in a book that gave seven things uh, that that Jesus' death is all about. And I'm going to shamelessly rip that off. If you want to see that quote, it's about to be posted on Facebook and Twitter. So if you want to follow that up and read the quote in full, uh, you can read that when you get home. Don't want to see you looking at it on your phones uh, while uh, while we're going through this. Uh, I'm joking, by the way. I'm not that strict. Um, 
But of those seven that this quote talks about, um, the seventh one is, the, is of greatest importance. So we're going to whiz through the first six, and then we're going to hang on the seventh and see what that one's all about. So the first thing about the cross is that the cross shows the evilness of sin. Sometimes something happens that shows just how bad humans can be, doesn't it? We know that. And if you saw the Jimmy Savile uh, documentary that was released on Netflix uh, in the last year, you'll have seen just how evil we can be as human beings. Sin is a problem that has uh, invaded every area of our lives for all of us as human beings. Uh, it's like some terrible disease that has taken over us all. And though we don't do all evil, we don't all do evil things like Jimmy Savile did. We are all as infected as each other with something that means we are all capable of great evil. And if Jesus had to die in order to sort out sin and its evilness, rather than just us trying harder, doing better, uh, turning over a new leaf, if Jesus had to die in order to take away our sin and our evilness, uh, then that shows just uh, how evil sin really is. So it tells us in, in verse 6 of what we read out that Christ died for the ungodly, for those of us who are wrapped up in sin and therefore do things that are evil. Secondly, the cross reveals God's love. Verse 8 says this, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So this is the very height of love that, that, that Jesus died for us. Now, if you knew someone who was dying and you knew that you could die in their place to save them, there are lots of scenarios you can think of. Maybe someone who's, um, who, who's in a burning car that's about to blow up and you, you drag them out or, or a health condition where if you give them something from your body, it will save them. Would you do that for someone else? Would you do it if it was someone you loved dearly? a really close friend or a spouse or a, a, a child. Uh, I think for many of us, if we were able to give our lives in order to save someone else that we loved, we would do that. It shows our love for someone if we're even willing to sacrifice ourselves for someone else. But Jesus dies for us even when we were enemies of God, even when we're against him. And that shows just how great his love is for us, even greater than a love for a spouse or for a child that we might have. He died for us, showing his love for us. Thirdly, the cross secures our acceptance with God. The issue of sin is that it creates this distance between ourselves and God because God is absolutely perfect and we are riddled with sin. And God cannot allow anything that is impure to come near him because if we came near him with our impurities, we would self-destruct. We would be overwhelmed by his perfection and we would be destroyed. But Jesus came and died and I think there's something in him stretching out his arms open wide. He, he joins humanity and God together. He, he draws us to himself so that we can be accepted with God. Though we are enemies by nature, Jesus dying rejoins us with God such that he's able to call us his children the ones that he loves. Uh, verses 10 and 11, they use a word here, reconciled, that we're rejoined together, made uh, friends in union with God once again. That's the kind of thing we're talking about here. Fourthly, the, mod uh, the cross models sacrifice for our lives. If Christians are supposed to live sacrificial lives, which we are, well, the supreme way that we see that and know what it looks like is by looking at what Jesus did on the cross. It, it, so uh, seeing Jesus willing to sacrifice inspires me and helps me and shows me that when I see a need that I can meet, even if it puts me out, then that is worth doing. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean I always do it perfectly, but Jesus shows us what it looks like. I fail many times. But Jesus dying on the cross at least shows us what it looks like to sacrifice ourselves, to put ourselves out in order to help other people. Fifthly, the, the cross inspires endurance in suffering. 
we all suffer, don't we, in life? Uh, you only have to live long enough, and you know that eventually that's going to happen, doesn't it? Uh, knowing that Jesus suffered to such an extent, well, it, it inspires us, doesn't it? It helps us to think, well, if he endured such suffering, then maybe I can endure such suffering. He will keep me going through the suffering. He will help me through the suffering. And then also recognizing the willing manner in which Jesus suffered. He knew it was coming. He willingly faced it anyway. Well, that should inspire us as well. It doesn't mean we go looking for suffering. We don't try to experience suffering. There'd be something wrong with you if that were the case. But it does mean that we don't allow suffering to break our world apart. We don't wallow in self-pity and, uh, 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 and feel completely overcome when we face suffering because we draw comfort from Jesus who suffered in our place first. Sixthly, the cross appeals to our hearts. So knowing exactly what Jesus has done in dying to show love, to overcome the evil that is in humanity, to bring us to God, he did so sacrificially and willingly. So knowing all of these things about the cross, well, that's what draws us to Jesus. Knowing that Jesus died for us is what draws us to Jesus. It appeals to our hearts. It helps us see the, the, the significance of what the cross is. And so we are drawn to Jesus uh, by the cross. Our hearts are, are overcome with gratitude and joy. We come in humility, but we're lifted up. Uh, we, we're drawn with the grace of God, giving us what we don't deserve by Jesus dying on our behalf. It is, it is being drawn to the cross uh, that we become Christians. It's in that that we become Christians. But everything that's been said so far would be lacking. It would be weak if it weren't for the seventh and final attribute of Jesus' death. And this is where we're going to dwell for just a few more minutes. So seventhly, the cross paid what we deserve in order to justify us. Now, in order to understand this, you have to understand what we deserve uh, because of our sin and how Jesus then paid for what we deserve uh, on our behalf. Uh, author and preacher Andrew Wilson, he explains it a little bit something like this. Imagine that all the waste you produce in your life is stored up in some massive container, some kind of vat. So instead of going to, to landfill and sewers, it collected in this massive vat. But at the end of your life, you've got to get rid of that by drinking it. And you're going to be disgusted by that, probably. And you should be disgusted by that. It's a horrible image. If you had to drink all of your waste at the end of your life that you've produced over the course of your life, that would be hellish. Literally hellish. And it would be never-ending as well, because if you drink that in, well, it will poison you, so it begins to internally destroy you, but also you're going to bring it back up again. And then you've got to drink it back down again. Sorry for being disgusting, but, but it's supposed to disgust you. Now, if you knew that was coming at the end of your life, what would you do with your life? You, you would try and produce less waste, wouldn't you? You try and use things that were recyclable or, or, or things that aren't going to create waste. But there's no way of stopping it, is there? We're all producing waste. And, and even if you reduce the amount of waste that you have created a little bit, there's still some hellish waste to endure at the end of your life that's going to kill you. And that's what our sin is like. So if you're disgusted by that image, well, you're supposed to be because our sin is like disgusting filth to God. We're piling that up throughout our lives. All of the times we've been selfish, all of the lies that we've told, all the greed that we've had, all of the ways that we've had unfair anger, we've just fl flown off the handle. Every time we've cheated or, or every time we've enjoyed lust when we know we shouldn't have done. Every time we've even been lazier than we should have done. All of that filth is, is piling up. But even more than that, every moment when we've ignored God, 
when we've rejected him in our lives, when we've not followed what he says we should do with our lives, when we've not loved him as we should, all of that is, is filth and it's piling up in this big vat. And the sins that we talked about, well, they're, they're just the little sins, aren't they? But all of those sins, if you counted how many there were in your life and my life, they, they would pile up over the years to a very large number, to a very big pile of filth. But what happens at the cross is Jesus says, don't worry, I'll drink it for you. All of that filth that is piled up high, I'll take it. This pile of filth that naturally would bring God's righteous anger for for our sin, Jesus says, I'll make it mine. I'll drink it down to the bottom. And what would happen if you drank a pile of filth? It would kill you, and it killed Jesus. But once he's drunk all of your filth, it's all gone. Once all of your filth has been taken by Jesus, there is nothing left in your container for you to drink at the end of your life, because Jesus has taken your filth for you. And for anyone who will accept that Jesus died for them, Jesus was drinking in the judgment that they deserve for every single one of your sins, if you trust in him. He died drinking in everything that you deserve for the sin in your life. And that's what Rhea and Jesse have come to accept for themselves. Maybe not with that exact image, But that's where their trust is. They believe that Jesus has died for them, taking their sin upon himself, paying for it in full. So that's what we deserve, and that's how Jesus paid for it. But what about this being justified? Well, this is a declaration that is made uh, uh, about us because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. Because he has paid for all of our sin, there is nothing left to hold us accountable. There is nothing left to say that we have done things that are deserving of God's judgment. But it's not just a declaration of being not guilty. It is not just a declaration of being innocent. It is a declaration of being positively in the right with God. If all we were is not guilty, then we would be in a neutral position. But what Jesus does is grants us his perfect life and says that's as if it were yours. You get to live in that. And because of that, you are declared as being in the right with God. So to be justified is to be credited with the perfect life that Jesus lived. Despite our sin, well, that's taken away because Jesus pays for it on the cross. But then we are given Jesus' perfect life as if it were our own life. We are not perfect when we become Christians, but God sees us through what Jesus himself has done. That's what it means to be justified. And here's how verse 9 puts that. Since we have now been justified by his blood, which is uh, his death on the cross, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? We're set in the right with God, and therefore there's no hell left to pay for the person who trusts in Jesus. We are justified. There's no judgment to fall on a person who trusts in Jesus. There's no judgment left to pay at the end of uh, one's life. And that's what happens when we trust in Jesus. So as we've already heard from Rhea and Jesse, they have chosen to follow Jesus. It's a big step in their lives. They have accepted that Jesus died for them, that he was drinking in the sin on their behalf, the sin that is rightfully theirs. They've let Jesus pay for it in full. And they, uh, as they trust in Jesus, they have been put in the right with God. In a few moments, they're going to go down into the water. And that will show that the old self is gone. The sinful self that was piling up uh, disgusting filth, that old self is gone. That old self of, of piling up sin because they trust that Jesus brings them complete forgiveness for every one of their sins. And then they will come back up out of the water. That's the bit most people being baptized are worried about, but don't worry, I've got you. 
They'll come back out of the water. And that will demonstrate that a new life has come. A new life, not that is perfect, they're going to carry on sinning. But a new life that is lived in the forgiveness Jesus offers. In the perfection that he himself has already lived. And the offer is there for each one of us. Any one of us is invited to come and participate in that. No one of us is not so bad that we don't need Jesus to have died and paid for us. We've all done wrong. We all need his forgiveness. And no one of us is so great a sinner that Jesus can't handle your sin. As the eternal Son of God, he can drink in the entirety of every single sin that you have committed. Nothing is too bad for him to have drank in and died for on the cross. So the offer is for you today that if you will trust in Jesus and ask him to forgive you, then you can know that on the cross he died for you. He died for your sin. He died to put you in the right with God and to make you one of his people. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for this great plan of salvation. Thank you that Jesus came into this world on a mission to die in our place. Thank you that he was willing to go through that, to take our sin upon himself so that we could be forgiven and set free and put in the right with you. Thank you for Raya and Jesse once again. We thank you for how you have worked in their lives to, to bring them to this point of trusting in you and accepting your forgiveness. And help each one of us to think about where we stand with you. Lord, if it is time for us to come to you, then may we come to you saying sorry for the wrong that we've done, accepting that you died, Jesus, on our behalf and giving our lives over to you. For your name's sake, amen.